Well, you might be like me and heard all these terms and we're not 100% sure on what they meant. Things is mining, blockchain, the Internet of Things. Well, I will tell you, we here at Safety FM have partnered up with a company that will explain this to you and will also have conversations to inform you on how you might have the potential of making passive income by being involved with this. All you need to do is go to safetyfm.com forward slash iHub. They'll discuss blockchain. What exactly is mining? What is cryptocurrency? And what is the Internet of Things? To find out more information, go to safetyfm.com forward slash iHub. That's safetyfm.com forward slash iHub. And don't forget to mention that Jay Allen sent you. This show is brought to you by Safety FM. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Jay Allen Show. I hope everything is good and grand inside of your neck of the woods. And hopefully you're having a fantastic week so far, because that's always important stuff to talk about. So anyways, over the last few weeks, you have noticed that we have been taking these deep dives into some other conversations of some things that we were talking about, some things that we were doing. And of course, a lot of it had to do with the world of psychology. Well, today we're going to take a a, a slight twist, a slight turn and go back to some of our roots. And today we're going to sit down and have a conversation with Ashley Donini. She is the CEO of Lola Link Consulting specializing in areas of utility transformation, risk management, and operation. Danini spent over a decade supporting sea changes from legislation to technology development and safety culture. Her career began in 2007 regulating the Commonwealth of Virginia. Ashley holds a degree from Virginia Commonwealth University Executive Master's in Energy Specialization from Ohio State. So... Without some further ado, let's get this moving and sit down and have our conversation with Ashley right here on The Jay Allen Show. The Jay Allen Show is streaming now on safetyfm.live. But, but let's, let's, let's have the conversation. How did this whole thing start for you? I, I, am, I was so intrigued because I know that we had spoken, I think it was either last week or the week before. How did you decide at one point, say, hey, I want to get into utility? How did, how did that come about? And you go, okay, utility is what I want to get involved in. I mean, I don't know of a lot of kids that turn around and go, hey, utility is my thing. So how did this happen? <laughs> yeah, I don't know of many uh, kids either, but I hope that, you know, that will change um, because utilities is a great space to be in. Um, but probably much like many in the industry, um, it started with no plan. I actually, um, I would say, um, had in my mind a, a definitely a different scenario for my life. Um, but it's been fun and interesting and totally unpredictable, unconventional. I, um, I guess if you asked the younger version of me, I would have never predicted that, right? So um, I actually started um, as an undergrad um, pursuing at the time, um, I wanted to pursue law school. So I was headed down that path and much like many other college students, was um, funding my own way and that came with a lot of part-time jobs. So really at that time, I just wanted stability and more structure. So I extended an outreach to my network of friends and colleagues and said, hey, I'm looking for um, a full-time job so that I can really go to night school. And um, a dear friend of mine, still a friend today, uh, reached out to me and, and said, hey, I've been talking to my director about you, and he said, if you can get your resume on his desk, 
by 7 a.m. when he comes in tomorrow, um, he'll take a look at it. And hindsight, you know, knowing him now, um, you know, he was testing my hunger for a role. They didn't have a role at the time. So he was like, I'm just going to be transparent. We don't have a job posting. You know, we don't, you know, we know we probably could use some extra help, but there's nothing formally in place. Um, And so I remember meeting my friend at a gas station at like 11 o'clock at night, passing over my printed resume. And what a good friend. He got in there early, put it on his desk. And, you know, I'm sure obviously um, he took a chance on me, but um, I imagine was a bit surprised and said, okay, she found a way. So I must now <laughs> at least take reach a look out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, so let, let me ask the strange question at this particular point in life. Do you already have a resume that you had built out or were you doing kind of like the part-time job where you were just filling out applications or did you already have something, I guess, proper already done before this, this moment occurs? Yeah, no, I, I did not have anything proper. So it was Mm -hmm. not only, you know, get it on my desk at 7 a.m., but create it and, um, you know, research how a resume should really look. (laughs) Um, and so it was all of that, but I think probably not very different from a lot of college students and their journey as they step into that professional world. So, um, it's actually a really, you know, that's an unpredictable way to start industry, but here I am and in an industry that I love. But that's the question. So how do you go from law? So this is a job (laughs) in the utility industry that is being proposed to you at the time? Yeah. So the commission, I didn't obviously know this at the time, but um, they didn't, they didn't have any roles posted, but at the time they um, were entering into what they call a rule to show cause proceeding. And really that's a court proceeding where they pursue or name a company or individual who's been violating law. And at the time it was, you know, utility safety code and they needed someone to come in and really just be dedicated to helping write testimony. And so two of my, I I think at that time I probably had four part-time jobs, but two of those were at private. (laughs) Yeah. College is expensive. (laughs) Um, but, uh, was that two of those jobs were at, um, private law firms and the paralegals, um, who I was really supporting through filing of thousands of elements of paperwork. And they let me, um, eventually gain their trust enough to sit with them and understudy a bit and, draft a little bit of their paperwork and testimony and obviously with a ton of oversight. So I, I was, the, the wheels were greased for that environment and it just so happened that that is what they needed. And so I came on and I um, spent a good six to nine months writing testimony for uh, the commission. So, so let's talk about that because it, it becomes interesting because you could almost see the foundational work on what's going on here, but he, this is still pretty heavy in the legal side of the house. Yeah. So at what point during this journey do you say, okay, maybe not being a lawyer is what I want to do anymore? And how does this transition occur? Yeah. So, so part of, um, when I, when I started at the commission, when you write that type of testimony, you you have to have a decent foundation on terminology and um, in the code just in general. And so the commission at the time had a really well-run uh, training program. And so one of those um, training programs that I that I went through um, taught me a lot about um, the why. Why does the commission exist? Why are these laws in place? And really anchored in the concept of safety. And to me, even 
the pers- like the perspective or naiveness of utilities just in general, it never connected for me until really that moment. And in specifically, and I leveraged this throughout my career as I've, you know, discussed and hired hundreds of employees and team members. Um, there was a specific incident that really caught my eye. It happened in Walnut Creek, California um, in 2004. And part of that training process was a review of that. It was a, it was a petroleum line ex- explosion and fire. Um, they were installing a significant water line. I mean, the contractor hit that, hit a jet fuel line supporting an airport, and um, many people lost their lives that day. And um, and as you went through that training process, they required you to read the OSHA report. And when I read the OSHA report, the fatalities didn't have a name; they had a number. And it just struck me like, wow, mind you, these were fathers, husbands, and that's where I think it really started to pierce me a bit to say, wow, like I never thought about something like this ever happening. You hear about it, but if you're not in that world, sometimes you you gloss over it. Um, and, um, and so I started you know, as I continued to write that testimony, I, it just started to have a different meaning for me. So, yeah. Well, no, and, and it's interesting because the more I'm I'm able to do this, the more kind of common that story is where there's always that one incident that is the one that does the shift. It's the one that um, makes you think differently to, to an extent on what's going on inside of there. So when you take a look at that impact, of when you're reading this OSHA report and all of a sudden now they're not people, they're numbers. Mm. And you're looking at this. At what point do you say, okay, this is where I'm going to start taking some deeper dives because you are taking some deeper dives. I mean, from what we could find right around this time, you said 2004, you're doing political, you're actually going to school for political science mm-hmm. right around that same time too. Right. If, if the information is accurate, if you tell me it's inaccurate, then we'll be no, like, okay, we, do, we definitely it. messed up. You've done your so, homework. <laughs> So when you're looking at this, all of a sudden, does the political science still kind of evolve with the, with the stuff that you're seeing? Well, it, the political science definitely had like this real tangible connection. And later in my career, it actually um, came, came to fruition more so than I ever could have probably thought a political science degree would. Um, but um, yeah, there were definitely connections in this um constructive tension between just the governmental process and timelines um, to enforce code, to change code, all in that vein of safety. And later down the the road at my tenure at the commission, um, I had an internship that I did with the Virginia General Assembly um, at the time, it was um, Representative Christopher Peace, and I um, got to kind of see a bit under the hood of that legislative process. And this was before I started with the commission, but um, was involved in a working group that really drove some um, impactful legislation, unprecedented legislation around sewer laterals. Um, but yeah, I mean, and I was able to leverage, you know, my understanding and my education in the political science, both in text academia, but also in that internship type of non-paid, by the way, but um, <laughs> valuable. It paid down the road, internship. right? Well, nowadays they have paid internships. I'm like, I what is didn't this? Know that when I was a kid. <laughs> this is the life. Um, but yeah, I learned a lot and was able to really connect. Um, and I think it, it definitely played to my strengths in that space. And then obviously throughout my career, having touched, um, a lot of different legislative changes or see changes within industry. So do you have some political aspirations now as well after seeing on, seeing under the hood, seeing behind the curtain? Uh, 
Uh, never say never, but where I like to really... Yes, that is a yes. That is a version of a yes. I'm going to throw that out. <laughs> I, yeah, never say yeah. never. Um, it's not on my radar as it sits yeah. today <laughs> in terms of being front and center, like a legit, like legitimizing um, politics. However, um, where I've operated a lot of my career and I actually enjoy it is really that behind the curtain type of space where I'm connecting this problem, challenge, vision and operationalizing it. And, and part of that journey, kind of taking that strategy to the street is very much, um, you know, what you often can see in careers and in and, and areas like lobbying, like political associations that are trying to educate and inform different advocacy groups. And so I've definitely played in that space for sure. Um, and influenced, I'd like to thank, um, for the better of the industry and just in general society. But um, in terms of sitting in the forefront, uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, but definitely support. There, there's definitely, it's kind of like being, my mom's a nurse. I always say it takes a special person to be a nurse. And I really think it takes a special person to be a politician. Um, but there is a force, um, a, a diverse force behind that, those scenes that really, you know, the politician can, you know, live and die by in terms of team. So part of that team, I would say, yeah, I'm part of that as it sits uh, today in advocacy. But um, I don't know if I see myself sitting in the driver's seat. <laughs> so, so we will be looking at what kind of political involvement you'll have later down the road. Ah, so you're not matter. buying <laughs> that. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm buying it. I'm just saying later on, on what you might be involved in, even if it's a behind the scenes type. Oh of yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. This is the Jay Allen show. This portion of the show has been sponsored by private internet access. America's number one virtual private network or VPN. Even if you use incognito mode, internet service providers is storing your browser data and many times even selling it. But private internet access or PIA can help you. PIA encrypts and reroutes your internet traffic through one of its own servers, hiding your data from your internet service provider or network admin. And with servers in over 75 countries, you can get unrestricted access to geo-blocked content from around the world. PIA comes with easy-to-use apps and browsers extension for all devices, a rock-solid privacy policy, open-source security, advanced customization settings, and it was just ranked the fastest VPN in the world by PC Magazine. And if you sign up right now with BIA, you can take advantage of a special deal only for Safety FM listeners. Only by using the following link, you can get the digital privacy for less than $2 a month. Yes, you did hear me correctly. Less than $2 a month and an extra four months for free. So that means for only $1.98 a month, and 83% off, you can get this service for you right now. That's so much more inexpensive than virtually every other VPN on the market. And if you get it right now, you can take PIA's 30-day risk-free challenge. You can try it out for 30 days, see if you like it. And if not, just return it for a full refund. So just go to safetyfm.com forward slash VPN. That's safetyfm.com forward slash VPN to try out the best VPN on the planet completely risk-free. Now remember, safetyfm.com forward slash VPN. And we are back on the Jay Allen Show on Safety FM. So, so let me ask this. I, I want to kind of go back a little bit to the utility portion. And of course, today is International Women's Day. So this is the time that we're doing the recording. I want to make a reference here that, of course, as you are aware, and a lot of us know, that utility, for the most part, is a is an industry that's heavily, heavily related to males. There's a lot of males in the utility industry. So as a woman, as you're going through this, how 
was there any difficulties when you're writing some of this testimony, when you're going about and saying, okay, this is what, this is what we're working on. How does, how is the industry at the time responding to you with what you're bringing forward? Yeah. I mean, um, that's a very, um, interesting question. Um, I've seen industry really evolve. Um, many that, that know me in this space would say I've grown up in industry and part of growing up in industry, I've not been able to only see it evolve, but I've really been um, surrounded by incredible people who have mentored me and guided me along the way through challenges that quite frankly, women experience in this industry that, you know, others don't. On top of that, I was very young when I entered industry as well. And so often I would find myself not only being the only woman in the room, but being the, the youngest by a long shot. And, and so, um, you know, as I've walked that path, um, there have been a lot of allies um, behind the scenes that have helped me. But yeah, there's definitely challenges that I've faced and I've had everything from cat calls on a job site where I'm inspecting, you know, a, a construction job site, um, you know, to, um, you know, leveraging and, and supporting, you know, young women who are trying to, you know, break, break through in the industry. So it's been really a, a hybrid of barriers and opportunities. What I always um, you know, in terms of reflection back on industry, what I've always try to coach and think about is there's a time, you know, to provide grace. Um, and then there's a time to, you know, push back and stand up for yourself um, in, in this space. You know, a lot of the progress that's been made, I think, has been through education. You know, there are times where you know, I, I would have this conversation and there would be this really offensive statement made, but the intention behind that statement was good intent and it was really ignorance that was driving it. And so the question that I always pose to women is, you know, do you want to make them an ally or a foe? Because, you know, you have more power and, and opportunity to create an ally to, to help you and, and also grow that space so that other women don't have to, to go through maybe certain challenges, or you can totally turn them off and, and it be, um, you know, not productive. So, um, I always try to think about it that way. And in most of my career, when I've done that, um, kind of provided an umbrella of grace, it's really, uh, I found that it's really education and they just didn't know versus other times where it's important for you as a woman leader to to exercise pushback. And, you know, you, you have to use your judgment and know when those lines get crossed. But I've had more encounters of ignorance than I have had of, you know, um, malice intent. So I guess let me ask the question. We can do it in one or two ways, of course. If you were taking a look at this and you were either giving advice to the younger, your younger self or giving advice to people that are coming up in industry, that they're saying, hey, this is what I want to get to, what would be your recommendation to either your younger self or the suggestions of the people that are coming through? Um, in context of being a woman or yes, just in, in general? Context. Okay. Right. We could do both too. I yeah. mean, whichever one, but because of, because right now we're seeing transition. Yep. We're not, yeah. we're not all the way there. So that's the reason why I, I put it into that particular perspective, because I think we'll be honest at some point, this conversation will be dated when it comes to women in industry, because that's not going to be a conversation of, oh my God, it's a male dominant industry. It's going to be a nice combination of both things. But as we speak right now in 2022, we're not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the first one I, the first piece of advice I would say is never suffer in silence because that's not productive to you and it's not productive to the industry. Um, but how you deliver that message really matters. And that's really kind of what I'm eyeing at, which is sometimes there's, you know, you, you kind of have to take a, take a deep breath 
and and source from a place of intent and question, you know, all right, you know, the barrier or challenge that I'm being faced with, is it because it's it's really driven by a desire for this male senior leader not to place a, a female in the role? Or is it, you know, they just don't know or haven't considered diversity and and how your experience connects to that. So, um, you know, I think the number one piece of advice is like, just don't suffer in silence um, and pay attention to how you deliver it. Um, because uh, no, no situation is ever the same. Um, and then there's plenty of the second piece of advice that I would say, which is sometimes unfortunate, but I do see it, um, which is women can also feel threatened by other women. Um, and my advice there is there are plenty, there's plenty of room. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, you really have to think about um, who you include in your network and how you continue to support other women um, as well. And, and not to see it at a, as an angle of competition, um, but really as an angle of support. Well, I, I appreciate that because I think that that will be something that people can look at now as we're going through this and things are transitioning and really apply it to what's going on. And I love that you decided to go go inside of Pandora's box because what you just said there that, you know, women don't have to compete with other women because there's a, there's enough room. Most people wouldn't even say that. I mean, so I'm glad that you have decided to go that far with it. So I appreciate it. Well, I have to walk the walk, but now right? now let's get into <laughs> You know, I get it. You, I get it. Yeah. And, 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 so, and you can't, I guess I would say you, you can't get to the real stuff that make that, that drives discussion and change unless you unpack the hard stuff. And sometimes that comes with difficult conversations and comfortable conversations, but that's also where the real change happens. And so, you know, you can't sit and suffer in silence. You you have to take an active role in, um, you know, bridging those, those gender inequities. So. You're so spot on on it. You're so spot on. It. Because I will tell you, I have had this conversation behind closed doors, but never in a public forum. Yeah. Most people won't talk about this. So I appreciate you doing that. Sure. So. I have to ask the question because you have done something that I think that is super brave, especially during the timeline that you have decided to do this. You have decided to go out on your own and start your own consulting. And you did it during the middle of a pandemic, which I think is either super crazy or super brave. I'm not sure which one yet. You're going to have to tell me. So why the decision to all of a sudden do it, especially during that particular time frame? Yeah. Um, well, I think you're not alone in that boat of, uh, <laughs> of going, whoa, the timing is crazy. Um, but, you know, there was really, I would say, um, two, two key things that really seeded that. So, like, throughout my career, I've always um, found myself, you know, as a problem solver. Um, and that's really afforded me a lot of opportunity to do a lot of cool and diverse things, but often on bleeding edge type of things and very strategic things. Um, and so that's given me, um, opportunity to see where gaps are and, um, and then, um, employ what I believe kind of to be gifts that I've been given. Everybody has them. Um, to help kind of translate and really allow those visions and strategies to come to life. And so um, I really just um, felt called to do something a little bit different. You know, I'd been in the public side of the the industry. I've been in the private side of the business as, as part of um, an executive team on one of the, the nation's largest utilities. Um, and um, And I wanted to see what it was like with that third what I would say third comp- stakeholder group, um, which is really the services side of it. Um, and, and, and really felt called to kind of step out a little bit and, um, and leverage that gift and just like this higher, more meaningful way. And it's really allowed me to do that. I've, I've connected with so many new, um, people, new talent, um, and working on incredible things that are meaningful, 
um, and really will serve the industry well. So I, I feel really good about that. And then, you know, the second the second seed um, that really kind of catapulted me is, and I was really kind of transitioning my thought process on stepping out um, on my own. I had a conversation with a really great friend of mine. Um, and, um, you know, we were just talking about, you know, is this something that I want, you know, want to do? I don't know. Um, but I know that I'm feeling called to do something different. And what he said to me was, well, Ashley, you know, you've demonstrated to date, no matter what you do, you're going to be great at it. The question now at this stage in your life is what story you want to tell your daughter, Lola, hence Lola Link at the time. Now I have two babies, so I have to probably figure out an, <laughs> another venture, but <laughs> co branding, co branding. Yeah. But, um, and it really stuck with me. He wasn't doing it. I, I think he, in many ways, said it just almost in passing, but it just sat with me for a really long time. And, um, and so I said, you know, there's going to be an opportunity where Lola is going to be faced with a decision and I, a a fork in the road in terms of decision-making. And I hope she has a ton of those throughout her life. Um, and I don't want her to settle for a choice because fear is there. And so um, I said, okay, well, I'm all in and like, I have to, you know, model this and I, and not just for Lola, but just for women in industry. I think, you know, I've seen it time and time again that even, for example, with job descriptions, women will say, well, I don't fit this job description at all, but I'd love to learn it and I think I can do it. And they never apply for the job. Um, and so they they really put themselves in a position where they're not, you know, putting their name in the hat for the opportunity. They're, they're sabotaging, sabotaging in many ways themselves. And so I just decided to take the leap. I never, you know, would have guessed I'd, you know, ever in my future would have been starting my own company. But it's really just... Um, you know, modeling that example as well for my daughter and and other women in industry and taking it day by day and step by step and, you know, learning along the way and having fun about it. So if people want to find out more about your consulting services and the things that you're doing, where can they go to find out more information? There's two key ways. Um, One is go to my website, www.lolalink.com. Um, or you can check me out on LinkedIn, um, both through Lola Link Consulting LLC or by my individual profile page, Ashley Danini. So here's a, here's a question. Do you accept people that you don't know on your LinkedIn? Because that's always, I always find that one interesting. <laughs> I do. Um, I do accept people that I, I do not know, but I definitely will view their profile on um, you know, to understand if there's a potential connection. I'm, you know, I think I, I always hear this, this um, concept of, you know, self-made. And I just don't believe that. I believe it takes a village. And sometimes those members of your village come through LinkedIn connections. And so, um, you know, I don't, I, I try to give people a bit of my time, see if there's a connection and how I may be able to help them. And, um, and it served me well so far. So that's, that's kind of how I operate on the LinkedIn space. <laughs> got it. Got it. Got it. Well, Ashley, I really do appreciate you coming on to the show today. Jay, thanks for inviting me. And um, for the listeners, thanks for listening. Want more of the Jay Allen show? Go to safetyfm.com. 
The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise, without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen.